Chapter 15, The Poets of Nigger Creek The irrepressible Garnet in his clean white shirt, ironed pants, and tidy boots, strolling across to camp each evening after imbuing the happy-go-lucky, though scanty youth of Nigger Creek, with their daily dose of knowledge, kept egging me on to write another poem just to keep the flame of the muse alive in the council jack he coaxed you know it's great fun for you for you yes i replied i do the braying you do the laughing no thanks never again cunning old mick of course backed up garnet you can go and jump in your own nigger creek i told him you made a goat of me once never again, but a paragraph in a southern newspaper tickling my silly fancy actually produced the poem. The moon on the great night showed a considerably enlarged audience. These mildewed old notes make mention of two swaggies, a wandering Indian hawker and two stray expectant visaged dogs, but I smirked at the firelit faces, absurdly pleased with my silly little effort. On your own heads be it, I explained generously. You've asked for it. You know I'm not a real poet like Mick. This verse only came to me when reading this newspaper paragraph, which reads, At a recent medical congress, A woman doctor gave her opinion that the increasing troubles of women folk are due to the fact that the human organs are reverting back to the animal form from which man evolved, and this medical wisdom suggested I write this poem entitled, When Gurley Goes Looking for Nuts. I cleared my throat and read... The doctor, the doctors tell us that our bones, to them a tale unfold of how we are degenerating from the usual human mold, for we are slipping back, they say, to what we were before, and by our tails will swing from trees in a thousand years or more. But this to me seems passing strange. "'Tis laughable if true. "'I pray my ghost will live to see "'the troubles it will brew. "'How will a politician look? "'If monkey he must be, "'will he harangue the crowd for votes "'while sitting on a tree? "'And will he promise them the nuts "'of others that he'll scatter "'and waste the precious fleeing hours "'on things that do not matter?' What tickles me, though, most of all, is how will Gurley take it? Will she quit spring up from her tail? Should a male monk strive to shake it? And will she comb her pretty fur, then gaze upon a pool? And will she fold her furry tail when sitting on a stool? Or will she pass her time of day in looking out for nuts, or coyly wander through the bush, a shyly meeting nuts? Or maybe she will climb a tree and crack upon her knees the really choice collection of her daily catch of fleas. O oh, joy, twill be if I am there to watch the pretty deers, to watch their little antics in another thousand years. The response was all that any poet could aspire to, though one of the stray mongrels, not to be outdone, began energetically scratching an ear. Get to blazes out of it, you flea bitten mongrel, ordered old brooks. Spraying your fleas all over us, 
No wonder, said Jembel, after what he's just had to listen to. Now, Jack, that really is poetry, declared Mick enthusiastically. You just must send that to the Bulletin. And his grizzled old face was all lit up. Bravo, bravo, Garnet clapped. Milton and Paradise Lost have nothing on the poets of Nigger Creek. Except fleas, said Jim Bell. Shut up, you goats, I protested. But it's real good, Jack, declared Old Brook solemnly. And so true to life. I'll say it is, chirped little Tommy Turley. So true to life, I've met a few women in my time. I grinned across at the chuckling Jim Bell and half-heartedly challenged him. Out with it. I've heard worse, he declared, from Mick, and once from a navvy in the horrors, but he was talked down from all sides. Jim just hasn't got a soul, declared Mick. Take no notice of him, Jack. The only soul I've got is where it counts, snapped Jim, as you found out yesterday when you trod on that rusty nail and it wasn't poetry you spouted when you hopped around either. Quite true, replied Mick, placatingly. But then no man can be prepared for every emergency. Accidents happen him from the cradle to grave. But that poem, and he smiled towards me, real true to life it could be. Why, I remember right now, when I was an innocent lad. Active as a monkey, Dad chased me up a sapling. He meant to chastise my rear with a belt. I grinned down defiance from a high in that safe refuge, thereby finding out I little knew the deep cunning of my parent. Keeping a baleful eye upon me, he retired to the wood heap but right smartly returned with the axe, and I felt the ring of doom as the axe bit into the quivering tree. It began to sway most sickeningly, with me clinging like a frightened monkey up in the breezy void. It leant slowly over, toppled, crashed down with a whoosh, but I had jumped clear as it hit the ground and was racing for the mulga, while my respected parent raced to loose the dogs and sew them onto me. <clears throat> and I had barely dived into that sheltering scrub, had not quite reached a friendly tree before my distant parent stood transfixed with pleasure at the music of my agonized howls. We applauded this youthful reminiscence while Mick grinned ruefully. You coves have never experienced the fangs of an ambitious dog tearing into the seat of your pants while you are in a hurry to climb a tree. I can assure you, you cannot climb that tree. I can feel those fangs in my vitals now. To return from a painful subject, I learnt a moral from that story. Be wary of monkey tricks. Moreover, when the old man means business, be certain that your tree is too big to be cut through in a day. Moreover again, be certain its branches are too high for him to reach you with a rock. To right, laughed Jim Bell. My old man has caught me bending too more than once. And I hope you've also learnt the moral that next time you tread on a nail, be sure you have your boots on. We live and learn, said Mick. If you've got anything to learn with, said Jim pointedly. Now, you boys, Garnet broke in. Ease off the back, the back chat. You tell us a yarn now, Jim. Silence is golden, replied Jim. That's why we haven't a feather to fly with, said Mick mildly. You smirking old 
baboon, declared Jim wrathfully. If you'd do a bit of toil instead of scribbling poetry, we might knock out enough coin for the storekeeper. But you've been doing a lot better lately, said Garnet encouragingly to Jim. Your ground is making richer all the time. No, replied Jim despondently. We're too unlucky. If it rained ten, it would be sure to fall down on to the other fellow's claim. And rain does fall that way too, said Mick brightly. Why, the selection next to ours always had more rain than we did. Why, asked Jim suspiciously. Because they had more land, chuckled Mick. Pity it didn't drown you, you moth-eaten old relic, replied Jim disgustedly. Come on, Mick, said Garnet. Tell us some more about your boyhood days. Those boyhood days, sighed Mick. Oh, why does man grow old? Because he's got time, growled Jim. Garnet refused to be put off. Now, Mick, you must have had a boyhood of sorts. Tell us about the times when your mother was wondering, Where is my wandering boy tonight? Ah, sighed Mick, times have changed. In my young days, poor mother used to wonder where her wandering boy might be. But now the lads spend half their time wondering where mother is. You old reprobate, Garnet laughed. Why, you're much more sentimental than I am. Tell us about your first love story then. Lost in the mists of antiquity, sighed Mick. Vanished with the wraths of, of romance. But he added modestly, I'm sure she made the first advances. Stone the crows, exclaimed Jim Bell helplessly. Just the facts of life went on, Mick, evenly. Experience has proved to me it's really the female of the species who is the hunter. Go on, Mick, Garnet urged. Let's hear that love story. I've lost track of the one I was going to tell, answered Mick mildly. But she was lovely as a rose in the moonlight. Jim Bell clutched his chest, breathing heavily. But which one? demanded Garnet. Oh, said Mick, the one I told she was the prettiest girl in the world. She whispered I was a handsome boy. She was blind, declared Jim decisively, and dumb as a fried egg. If she'd put a hand over your face, she'd have thought she was stroking a gorilla. Mick sat smiling at the fire. She used to kiss me lingeringly. I was flattered until I tumbled to it that she was just smelling me for some other cat's scent. He sighed then. Ah, but her every sniff was a thrill to me. No lovesick girl ever waited so longingly for her mail as I waited to meet the postman's daughter. Ah, he sighed again. I loved that girl, but the local butcher put it all over me. But Mick, protested Garnet, I could never believe a poet who would let a butcher beat him for the postman's daughter. Ah, sighed Mick, her father only owed me a tenor, but he owed the butcher fifty quid. Chapter 16 Jim Bell's Passing Worries Meanwhile, I had chummed up with my jungle mate, as half-laughingly I came to call him. Eventually, I came to realize it was he who had chummed up with me, and then only for a short trip at a time when his irresistible walkabout itch came. 
for this man was essentially a silent prospector. He wanted no mate. He worked and traveled entirely on his own, lived on his own too, not until some years later when I had learnt through experiences in the peninsula farther north did I gradually realize why the jungle man had partially chummed up with me. It was because at times he became desperately lonely. He loved loneliness, loved all the lonely places and the beauty that so often broods there. But at times, loneliness got him, and something else that is born deep in human nature. He had no one to tell his secrets to, secrets of nature that he hugged to his heart, secrets of the wild bush that he had learnt in loneliness, and I don't know what years of constant wanderings seemed to well up within him now and then, Secrets of humankind, too, and far deeper, hauntingly elusive secrets that puzzled me uneasily on occasions. How he intuitively realized I was so anxious to learn and would be sympathetic, I don't know. It was not until years later I realized how much I could have learnt from that strange man. We had met casually in Herberton to the few who took any notice. He was known as a very quiet chap, came into Herberton occasionally for stores, had a claim somewhere out on the dry river, was vaguely known as a wanderer, and that was all, while Mick and Jim strolled across to the post office. On our little business, the stranger and I had yarned away in the sunshine, sitting on our haunches outside Jack and Newell's store. He seemed a youngish man, only a few years older than myself, though I realized later that he could not be as young as he seemed. But I soon found out that he was immeasurably older in bush experience. Eagerly, I asked questions about the dry river and the country around. He answered in a soft voice with a slight drawl and brought a chain of pictures to the mind's eye. Soon, I was merely listening. The dry river, he explained, joins the wild river near Herberton. Jim Mulligan himself had a claim there a few years back. The dry river heads back south from Herberton into very rough country, from near Mount Misery, Wooloman Creek runs into it, through a country a goat could hardly scramble over, good tin there too, the dry river heads in gullies like the wrinkles round a very old black fellow's eyes, up by the main divide, cross over the divide and you drop down into Irvine Bank. Maybe we'll take a trip across there some time if you are interested. I nodded. Any time will do me, I said eagerly. The Wild River watershed, he drawled, is a maze of mountain tops and spurs and ravines gone wild. You barely see the outline. Down here by the river, it must have been a hell on earth in the days of the big volcanoes. The river valley is only a miniature now, compared to the valley of those times. Just across there, he pointed, is Chinaman's Hill, where MacDonald, the prospector, sank a shaft and found the first sign of the deep lead, the same that you're working on at Nigger Creek. Shafts running for miles and tunnels have now proved that the lead is really some old-time valley of a vast river system, long since filled up with lava. The, le the lead runs around the town, roughly parallel with the present river right to Nigger Creek, where it junctions with another buried old river coming from under Bradliff's 
gully. So right where your camp is now was once a sea of molten lava boiling on for miles over Flaggy Creek. We don't know for what distance. You know that the main river did carry on past Flaggy for tunnels there have now proved to be half a mile wide. The big tunnel is driven in right through the old bed for 3,000 feet and more. Some tunnel that. Maslin's tunnel goes in over a thousand feet. A great job that for working miners on their own resources. In that dangerously unsafe ground, we don't know how big and deep and wide that old river was. You see how narrow the wild river is just across there. Well, imagine a river away below it, half a mile wide, and think how differently this country must have looked then. The mountains must have been much higher, too. If Herberton had been built those days, we would have been perched thousands of feet higher up. Up amongst the smoke, I grinned. How true, he nodded grimly, and hurtling rocks, white hot, the sky, a dense blackness of fumes, shot through with flame, as you'd realize if you knew of the old volcano craters, stretching all the way throughout these ranges. Many of them have not been seen by white men yet. Jack and Newell's store would be made of white hot pumice stone, and we'd be queer-looking things with snouts breathing sulfur fumes instead of air. Where a man sat down to cool off, he'd have to be made of asbestos. Otherwise, he'd burn his trousers. I'd often thought of it when camped alone up on the old mountain tops, gazing down here through the starlight. He smiled fleetingly. I was to learn he seldom smiled. Maybe there's asbestos men up in the stars, I suggested. I've wondered that way, too, he replied seriously. Why not? Anyway, how differently the country must have looked then. The old bed carries on miles farther than Flaggy. Of course, we don't know the end of it, nor the beginning, nor how many other ancient rivers lie buried under the basalt. By the way, he added, have you seen the old crater yet? No, I replied with interest, but I vaguely heard about it. Overshadows the town, he said. So far as a crater is concerned, it must have rained hell and fury across here many a time, for a hundred miles and more, much more. This particular crater is not so very far from your camp, just a bit of a climb. I'd very much like to see it. Very well, I'll pick you up at your camp. One of these days, have you seen the Crater Lakes? No, I replied eagerly. I've heard about them, and that's all. They seem to be very mysterious and beautiful. They are both, they are down, Yungaburra Way. We may have a look at them, too. Easy to get at, only take a few days. But here come your mates, and I must get back up to camp. So long. Casually, he stood up with a nod to Mick and Jim and strode quietly away. Thereafter, before we took that stroll, that just a bit of a climb to see the old crater, he appeared at Mick's camp twice, just walked quietly in from the night into the firelight, nodded a greeting and accepted Mick's welcome to a seat in the council. He listened quietly throughout each evening, never speaking unless spoken to, and at the break-up each evening with a good night all. He strode away into the darkness, having quietly declined a camp with Mick or me, and yet his camp was miles away, up along the dry river. Whether he walked along on that rough climb where another man would break his neck, 
or just lay down and camped when he felt like it until sunrise. I don't know. He was always like that, but I was to learn he had owl's eyes and was tireless. Quaint bird, mused Mick. A lone wolf, declared Jim Bell. I've met just one or two like him before. They are scarce, but they exist. But sort of bloke who would murder you nice and quietly, all very methodical-like, as a matter of course, and not a soul ever know a thing about it. Oh, come now, Jim, Garnet laughed. He's a listener and exceptionally quiet, but I took a vague fancy to him, which soothed my somewhat startled thoughts, for we all were familiar with true stories of murdered prospectors who had dug their own graves, but never knew it. The first evening that he came, Mick was due to deliver himself of another poem. It's a real masterpiece, Jack, chuckled Garnet, when he had called for me that evening. Mick is all het up and mysterious about it, fairly breaking his neck for you to come across and hear it. Come along, or old Shakespeare will go into a decline with suspense. It was when we were just nicely settled down that the tall... figure had stepped into the firelit circle. I thanked my lucky stars I wasn't the one who had to deliver a poem. But he sat there and absorbed it all making no comment even in the inevitable chit-chat at the finish, and here is Mick's masterpiece. The Bell of Nigger Creek. Some say it's dark-eyed Polly. More say it's Rose or Nell, but I think it's only folly to try and pick the bell. There's lovely maids in Nigger Creek, both white and black and brown, and I think it's height of insolence to look for girls in town, for here you'll find the prettiest maids that any could wish to see, and some their color never fades through dye or ancestry. We'll toast them all in sparkling wine, the dark ones and the fair, and when we find that precious ten, we'll have a grand time there. In an expectant silence, Mick modestly closed his manuscript book. Then, well, of all the awful tripe, burst out Jim Bell. Is that the muck you've been chewing your pencil over for a week? He strains his tripe out and brings forth a gnat. Thank heaven there's no more of it. Garnet tried to protest, but he was gurgling with laughter. So the rest of us hastened to congratulate Mick. The best poem ever written in Nigger Creek, we assured him, or ever likely to be. And old Mick's grizzled face broke into a smile. To think that for a solid week, splurted Jim, I've been toiling down that shaft while this idiot, I've been pulling up the buckets, protested Mick, pulling my aunt. Now Jim broke in garnet. You've been toiling like a galley slave, we know. But then you do not understand the throes of composing poetry. Throws my fat aunt, snapped Jim. He'll have me throwing a seven one of these fine days, and you blokes will be to blame. Old Brooks poured oil on the ruffled waters by declaring that while Jim was a good worker, Mick was a good poet, the bootmaker to his last, he declared. I don't know how long I'm going to last, said Jim morosely, with a lunatic like that for a mate. But then Jim chuckled Garnet. The dividing line between genius and imbecility is known to be very fine indeed. Then he's gone over the line, declared Jim. Gone over by a mile. This, of course, set us all championing Mick. What if you take the floor tonight, Jim? Chuckled Garnet. 
Come on, be a sport. You've often promised to tell us some of your reminiscences. It was on the tip of my tongue, said Mick. Then hang on to it, advised Jim disgustedly, and you might get tongue-tied for once. Do you remember, asked Mick, grinning across at his mate, that sourpuss of a waitress down in the pub we stayed at in Cairns. You remember the one you complained to because there were flies in the soup. And what do you want for a Zack? she snapped. Civility, you growled. Then take your money's worth, she yapped and slapped your face. Yes, said Jim. What about that scraggy hen? She's getting married. Struth, that rat bag, who's the happy man? Her father. I'm afraid we howled with laughter at Jim's expressive face. Even the jungle man half smiled. Old Mick smiled angelically down at the fire. Come on, Jim, coaxed Garnet. Was that the pub you cleared out from because the lady cook put jollop in your soup? No, answered Jim bitter bitterly. That was across on the Stannery Hill's side. I'd been down on the Tate doing a horse out of a job. I had one of those mates who believed in calling a spade a spade, but he didn't believe in handling one. So I rolled up the drum and mounted Shank's pony. It was some walk at, at those times, too. Between job and job, tin was down. At last, I landed a job shoveling mullock for the tightest skin flint I ever knew. Always swearing money isn't everything, but he was too mean to spit on his shadow for fear of giving it a wash. He'd never have any but married men work for him. He could blackguard them to his heart's content. They <clears throat> daren't walk away from a job, but the single man would roll up his swag, maybe show fight as well. I told him I was camped with the wife down the creek. He asked if she was a black gen. I told him it didn't matter. I had four kids to keep anyway. That satisfied him. He introduced me to a shovel and heap of mullock a team of horses couldn't have shifted in a month. He told me to shift it in a week with a wheelbarrow or roll up the drum and go. He stood over me toiling at that mullock until even the pack mules gave me away in disgust. When I fastened on to my first pay, I rolled the barrow down the gully and him with it then rolled up the drum and went. I came on the pub in a little place in the hills near Stannery. It was a civilized place. They even had a doctor in it. But if the poor devil was a doctor, he was only there because he'd drink rum from an oily rag. The pub was an up-to-date pub. It had a billiard table in it. You know, those crazy tables that were built when Adam was a boy. The green was in patches where <clears throat> there was any green left. The balls were all of a fly brown red color. You had to learn to tell the red from the white by the shape of the balls. Some wobbled a bit more than others. The cues were homemade. The nigger rousebout made them when he wasn't toiling at the wood heap. However, it was to be home to me for a week anyway. My boots were worn out. I was dog tired. If I couldn't get a job in a week, at least I'd have a spell before hitting the track again. Just to make a show, I breasted the bar for just one drink. No matter how broke you are, you're not accepted in polite society unless you do. There was one flea-bitten customer sprawling over the bar, and a publican built like a sack of horse meat was sprawling towards him. By the nasty look on that baboon's face, his customer was making some complaint. You can't 
get better beer anywheres, snarled the publican. Can't I, snarled the customer. I got my beer here last week, and I ain't got better yet. It was the same with the coffee, went on Jim mournfully. They called it coffee, but you had to drink the whole flaming teapot before you got a taste of the coffee. Same with everything else. Even the fleas on the dog had taken to the scrub. Jim filled his pipe in mournful retrospect. Reaching down to the fire, with expert fingers, he lifted a live coal to the pipe bowl, puffed deliberately, and resumed. In what they called a room, my company was a fellow guest, a lucky one who had a job down at the come by chance. He didn't bother me. He drank himself to sleep every night so he wouldn't feel the mosquitoes biting. The cook, Jim frowned, was a cackling old hen who thought she was the belle of New York. She had her eye on that poor devil of a doctor. She had a face like a horseradish, all mildewed through lying outside in the wet season. But she doctored it up with pig's grease and a touch of red ink, dolled herself up in her glad rags, sent for the doctor, and when she heard him coming, sort of collapsed in the kitchen, and I'm blessed if she didn't show half a yard of lace strides. I know because I was bow peeping in on the old she-cat. Well, the doctor came. He would have been quite a decent sort if only he could have left the grog alone. He unfastened her. Duds examined her in what seemed to me a real professional sort of way, thumped her scrawny ribs, pummeled her in the brisket, squeezed her navel, it was big as a salt cellar, looked more and more puzzled, at last he doused her with water, and she came too, groaned like a horse with the gripes, sat up and yowled, oh, what's wrong with me? Nothing, said the doctor quietly. You've got nothing to worry about. It's only a slight attack of faintness, merely a sign of advancing years. She was on her feet with a yell, grabbed a saucepan, and donged him. He went down like a pole-axed steer. Jim paused, glaring at the fire. Well, queried the, interest garnet, the interested Garnet. Oh, there's nothing much more, said Jim. I felt sorry for the doctor, and I was fool enough to start telling her what I thought of her. She didn't let me finish. I poked my bib outside that kitchen a damned sight quicker than I'd poked it in. Well, sniggered Garnet. Oh, there's not much more to tell, said Jim, almost shamefacedly. I left. Why? Oh, well, it was that night she put the jollop in my soup. Did you remember to pay your bill? laughed Garnet. Well, now I did not, answered Jim with a surprised glance at Garnet. And how did you get out of that? persisted Garnet. Oh, I just put it down to running expenses, answered Jim modestly.